Today, we are lucky enough to be with John Leland, who is the Vice President of Insights and Head of Environmental Impact at Kickstarter. He has also launched two projects on Kickstarter that I really like for their tough love approach to awareness raising on climate. There are stickers that say, this place will be water, and another one that says, this place will burn, that you put in public places based on science-based projections. And these projects give people the tools to understand and communicate the local near-term impacts of climate change and begin to mobilize their community to take action on the climate crisis and you know, at least start the conversation, get people thinking, which is a good place to begin. Most recently, John helped launch the four day week campaign, which I'm really excited to learn more about today. Uh, and particularly the climate implications, which is something you might not typically think of as a benefit of a four day work week. So John, welcome to the show. Thank you so much for having me, Ryan. Yeah, I'm excited. So before diving into your three awesome climate projects, <laughs> let's start with you and your climate journey. So when did you decide to work on climate and why? Are there any particular moments that really stick out to you? Or do you remember your, you know, your thought process in that decision making? Yeah. Um, so I came to climate about 10 years ago through really an accident. Um, I was in law school at the time and my summer associate uh, work was in New York City for a major Wall Street law firm. And that law firm had a relationship with the Palau mission uh, to the United Nations. So Palau is a small Pacific Island country. I believe it has somewhere between 50,000 and 100,000 citizens. Um, mm -hmm. And because they are so small and they need to represent their interests in this big uh, international forum, they had formed a relationship with this law firm to pull in sort of the brain trust of that law firm to help them formulate policy and advocate for their interests. And I got put on that project, uh, which was a pro bono project. So the law firm wasn't getting paid for this work uh, and got assigned climate policy, uh, which uh, I had I didn't have any experience with prior to that. So I jumped straight in and, and worked with them on developing a proposal for a world climate organization that was sort of modeled on uh, the mechanisms that the World Trade Organization has, which are honestly far more effective uh, enforcement mechanisms than we currently have uh, on climate. Mm -hmm. So in the process of developing that proposal, I obviously learned a lot about climate change and the plight of Pacific Island countries and wound up attending the first UN Security Council meeting on climate change back in wow. 2011. And at that meeting, the president of Nauru, another small Pacific Island country, got up and spoke in front of the diplomats of the United States and Germany and Russia and, and all the attendees and nearly cried as he talked about losing his country within the next 50 years to rising sea levels. Um, and that was a really pivotal moment for me and, and sort of understanding the just how serious the, the the climate crisis was and just how near term it was as well that this was something that i was going to see this man's country disappear uh within my lifetime most likely so that started my journey in in, in terms of making sure that i built I, I was working on climate no matter what else i was doing i was working on climate for the next um several years amazing well i'm I'm glad that uh, happy accident, as you put it, happened. Um, and yeah, I when you're just talking right there, it makes me think of a slogan I've heard from the the Island Nations: "One point five to stay alive." Yeah. And I don't know. I think it's it's it'd be impossible for someone to hear the president speak like like you heard and not really you know feel that right in the heart. Um, yeah, yeah, he spoke about, you know, he said, if, if it was New York City and Washington, D.C. and Paris and London that were all going, you know, England and the United States that were all going to disappear, literally, in, in the next 50 years, the response would be very different. But because it's these countries that aren't prioritized, the change hasn't happened. 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And, and that, that was really heartbreaking. Yeah. Uh, on a more positive note, they did fight really, really hard to get 1.5 degrees into the Paris Agreement and were successful, mm -hmm. which is amazing. And I think since then, you know, there's an IPCC report uh, comparing 1.5 to 2 degrees, and that only happened because of their advocacy. And I think a lot of people have woken up because of that report. Um, so I think everyone owes a, a great deal of gratitude and our best efforts to them. Yeah, that's a great point. And honestly, those Pacific Island countries punch way above their weight uh, on the international stage. They've, they've, they've learned how to be very smart about diplomacy in ways that are fascinating when you get inside of, of those machines. Um, but yeah, you're right. We, we do owe them a lot of uh, credit on a lot of the, how aggressive the new international sort of conversation has shifted towards. Yep. Much, much needed. Um, so can you briefly walk us through the rest of your climate journey? How did you go from there to where you are today? Yes, I, I joined Kickstarter back in 2014 after being a lawyer for about six months. Uh, I did not want to be a lawyer. <laughs> yeah. Uh, as you can imagine, if I was one for only six months. And I joined Kickstarter more in a, in a, in a business and growth capacity. Um, but as we developed and I continued caring about the, the climate crisis, uh, Kickstarter made the decision to reincorporate as a public benefit corporation mm -hmm. back in 2016. And as part of our corporate charter, we uh, baked in environmental commitments and a commitment to reducing our, our impact on the, on the environment, which was fantastic and gave me an opportunity to own that work within the organization because it was something I had had some experience with and cared a lot about. Um, so I jumped into just leading that work. I raised my hand. I think it's where a lot of corporate environmental leaders come from. It's just people who care a lot about these issues and are willing to roll up their sleeves and tackle the work. Uh, which is something I would encourage anyone listening to also explore doing. If, if there's no one owning that at your workplace, uh, it might be worth thinking about owning it <laughs> because it certainly opened up uh, a lot of opportunities for me to have a positive impact on climate and just under, you know, play a, a larger role in this fight. So since then, we have gone net zero. Uh, we uh, reduce our carbon footprint every year. We, we are a member of the climate neutral campaign. So we've made that commitment um, to offsetting our carbon footprint every year. We also worked with the Environmental Defense Fund on developing framework for the creators on Kickstarter to adopt environment, environmental commitments as part of their projects, the products they're putting out into the world, knowing that our biggest lever as an organization is really owning this marketplace and baking environmental and sustainable practices into these brands, into these products at their inception. Since yeah. we have we have companies like Peloton and Allbirds and Oculus Rift, these, these much larger companies than Kickstarter itself uh, emerge from our platform. If we can get those companies committed to sustainable practices, then uh, that's much more important than what Kickstarter does, given our footprint is very small, honestly. Yeah, that's, that's really cool. So you help ingrain it in the DNA of these new companies that are being born every, every day or week or whatever it is. That's exactly the idea. And at this point, we see 75% of the campaigns that get funded on Kickstarter that are for physical products um, mm -hmm. adopt environmental commitments uh, as part of their uh, campaign. That's awesome. So let's get to the two projects that you have launched on Kickstarter. Uh, Tell me more about this place will be water and this place will burn. So like, I guess what I want to cover is where did these ideas come from? How does it work? Why does it matter? I've got a couple more questions, but we'll, we'll start with those. Yeah, I think when I think about, I think a lot about the psychology of climate change and how people relate to it. 
and it's shifted a lot over the years, uh, over the last five years, certainly. But I've long been very interested in the fact that most people believe, understand that climate change is real, uh, but don't really act on it for a long time. And it's changing now, but for a long time, you had all of these people or the vast majority of people understood this was a problem, but just didn't want to think about it. Um, and so if they could avoid thinking about it, they, they would choose to do that, which is very understandable. It's a very stressful, overwhelming existential problem that it's hard to face directly. Um, I, even working in climate, I have a hard time like, staring directly into the sun of climate change and really contemplating the, the truth of it, right? I think even those of us working in it are, are usually kind of looking, <laughs> we're aware that we should be staring, like, it, it's too much to stare directly at the sun, right? Like, so yeah. we're, we're aware that's there and we're, we're going towards, towards that, um, but kind of staying like a, a little bit of, keep your eyes a little bit away from it. But we, we've been doing that way too much on a societal level and people were just completely avoiding the topic internally um, from a psychological perspective. So I was interested in the question of, well, how do you create interventions that uh, are surprising to people that put, put this in their face and remind them of this issue mm -hmm. uh, at moments that are unexpected or different than, than they might otherwise be hearing these messages and in a way that personalizes it. So this isn't just some big existential, like kind of over there or thing. It's something that's going to change the community that you are currently living in. Um, and so that's where thinking about sea level rise and the places that we will lose and particularly living in New York, which is very, very vulnerable to sea level rise. I was like, well, let's, let's take all this data. We know what's going to be underwater. And let's just start telling people, hey, this place you're standing in is going to be underwater. <laughs> um, and put that message as, as far and wide as possible. So I, I had the idea of, of sort of marrying this public activism art campaign, which was very fun to design, to be honest, um, the stickers for and things like that, uh, with the public data that exists out there. And the project went really, really well. Uh, it got coverage in The New Yorker and Bloomberg, and we have tens of thousands of people participating in the project all over the world. And following the success of that, I, I wanted to do wildfire as well. And, and um, that was a much more challenging project, actually, just from a data perspective. And so I wound up working with um, prof a professor at the University of Idaho who specializes in wildfire mapping to mm -hmm. create a map of, of the United States and where on a county level, what was going, where was wildfire risk going to um, increase substantially and then sent out, you know, and then offered again stickers and, and posters for people in those communities to put them up uh, <laughs> on wildfire. I feel a little bit worse about that one because it's the wildfires are, are here for a lot of those communities. So it's yeah. it's not a future prediction. It's a, it's a present reality, but there's still large swaths of the West where those those risks haven't yet really creeped up and, but they will. Um, mm -hmm. And so getting that message out into those communities so that people are motivated to push their local representatives and their local governments to take action. Yeah. Yeah. Start prioritizing the issue. Yes. Um, it reminds me in some way of a, uh, a line I heard from the Sunrise Movement, which I love, and it's it's saying that climate is really about protecting the people we love and the places that we call home. Yeah. Um, and I I hope I think what you're doing, uh, even if it is a bit more of an intervention than than folks might might want on their walk around the block. Um, I think that could definitely help to get them thinking about it more and start prioritizing it, talking about it, you know, moving in the right direction. Um, so I'm curious, do you have any favorite stories that have come out of these two initiatives? Oh boy. Um, well, it's very, it's very fun meeting people. I had this experience just a couple of weeks ago of meeting people who I don't know, who come across it, who, who are meet me and then are aware, made aware that, you know, 
somehow comes up that I created the, this place will be water campaign. And they're like, oh, I had that. I've, I've had your sticker on my laptop for the last five years. And I put up <laughs> dozens of these stickers all over San Francisco or, or New York. Um, so that's very fun uh, to see. And, and, you know, in talking to, to people about it, it's people are also looking for a way of talking about this and voicing their concern within their communities. So mm -hmm. for me, a lot of what's, what I've found to be most enjoyable about this, these projects and talking to people that have participated is their sense of relief at having a mechanism to share their concern within their community. And it's, I think a lot about the, this journey that people, everyone kind of needs to go on with climate, uh, climate change. And it's so important that we give people agency in this fight. It's a, it's a really hard problem with climate change where we, we're asking everyone to sort of like acknowledge it and face it and not just despair in the face of it. But in order to get people out of that despair, you have to give them some agency to do something within this, yeah. within this fight. And we don't have that many clear calls to action. If here's this thing you can do. Um, obviously calling a representative and voting along these issues is critical. Uh, there's obviously a lot of interest in and then concern about the limitations of personal choices as it, as it relates to climate change. Um, but we need to, I think it, it's an underdeveloped aspect of sort of the climate fight is giving people clear avenues for participation and agency in both addressing climate change and, and you know, decarbonizing our economy and also building up resiliency within their communities so that they don't feel so scared and vulnerable. Um, and both of those, both of those are lacking. So it was really nice hearing from people that they felt really empowered by the campaign. Yeah, no, that's, that's awesome. Um, it also goes well with, with what I try to tell folks um, about, you know, the question, what can I do? And I think a lot of people get tripped up on it because this issue is yep. so massive, so overwhelming. It's pretty easy to slip into the thinking of what I do doesn't matter, even though that is completely false. <laughs> um, but what I try to tell folks is to, you know, just start with trying to change the places where you live and where you work. And that falls right in line with, you know, changing the community that you're a part of or the the state, whatever it may be, and uh, trying to make the leaders uh, at all levels to make the right policy and investment decisions like from this day forward so we can do as much to decarbonize and adapt and make our place as resilient as we can. Um, so I definitely I applaud what you're doing. Thank you. I mean, and I think that that's great advice. Certainly, it is an overwhelming question, but I think starting at that, that local level and where you live and where you work is, is fantastic. And if you do start that work, you start, there are unexpected things that happen, opportunities that open up. I'm just talking mm -hmm. about, you know, pushing for local leaders and politicians to act on climate. I've actually been participating today and yesterday in um, advocacy on Capitol Hill to encourage uh, members of Congress to move more aggressively on climate, particularly with regards to the infrastructure bill that's mm -hmm. currently in front of Congress. Um, but that's not something I planned on doing. It was just something that came about because I took, you know, I, I, picked, I took up the flag of, of climate change at my workplace. And as I've continued to work on it, these sorts of opportunities actually came to my door and it's like amazing. Great, I get to now yeah. talk to members of Congress about why we care about as a as a as a business that operates in their communities, but them taking a, a bold stance on climate change. Um, so that's amazing. It's all about getting started and sort of seeing where the path takes you. Mm -hmm. I'll say one more thing for folks listening on that. I think a, a big part of the first steps is to think about your unique skills and experiences, you know, resources, network, like every person is going to be able to contribute something slightly different. And we need all these pieces to the puzzle to, uh, 
I mean, this is an all hands on deck sort of issue. So whatever you're good at, try to find that intersection with climate and, and start moving forward. Yeah, it's one of the um, things that I think is really beautiful about climate change, actually, because which understandably is a it's something that's easy to despair about. But oftentimes when I think about the actual fight to address this problem, it gives me so much hope because we have these problems of you know people feeling a lack of purpose, a lack of community in our society that we've just gotten worse and worse. And here we have this amazing opportunity to like all band together, leverage kind of everyone's unique skill set to do a bunch of really cool stuff, really hard, cool stuff to save the planet together. It's like, what more purpose do you want than <laughs> yeah. saving the world? And I don't, again, I don't think like we, we sort of in the, in the climate community, it's, it's been an aspect of this, of this, this sort of opportunity of this moment that's been missing from the discussion. I completely agree. That was, that was really well said. It's, we need to flip that switch of it being seen or framed as a cost to an opportunity and all the benefits and like all the good things that would come of us addressing this massive issue. Well, um, have I got a benefit for you? <laughs> <laughs> yes. Let us switch gears here uh, and start talking about the four day work week. Mm -hmm. So I don't know uh, how much you know on like the context or the history of the work week, but I, I feel like I should ask you and that'd be a good place to start so we can kind of, you know, start from the beginning here. So do you know where the idea of the four day work week comes from? And then also, do you know, maybe start with this, what the history of the five day work week is in the first place? Like, why do we have what we have now and how has this been progressing over time? Yeah. So, uh, I think it's good to start with that history because it can seem like the five day work week is this law of nature <laughs> that has to be the way that we operate, uh, yeah. when it is just a construct that we developed as a society. So the five day work week, um, came about through a series of sort of labor movement um, in, uh, initiatives in the 1800s and early 1900s. Uh, in the in the mid 1800s, the um, 40 hour week was established um, through uh, just advocacy from labor unions. At that time, though, people were working a six day week. Um, and a six day week was the norm in our society until the early 20th century, when really, uh, there were some early adopters that were smaller, but Henry Ford was the really first major corporation to adopt a five day work week from a six day work week. And in large part from, for, from Ford's perspective, it was to give his employees the time to actually use the product that they were making. Um, cause he was trying to make his employees a sort of base of customers for the Ford product. And yeah. so he adopted a five-day work week, um, and really inventing the weekend and this sort of weekend leisure economy and behaviors in the United States it was really built around the car. And obviously it worked out really well for Ford. It did, <laughs> um, as a company and Kellogg is actually the, was the kind of the second mover in that, um, transition also worked out really well for, for Kellogg. So the five day work week kind of then rippled through the economy from, from there. And it took about five to 10 years for it to really kind of fully transition. Um, it's not something that you can do overnight. Right. And predictions were at that time and honestly throughout the 20th century, Nixon spoke with us said that working hours would continue to fall. Uh, they had been following for the, the previous hundred years. It is, well, as we get more productive, as we invent more automation, we'll be able to reclaim time for ourselves. And that isn't what happened. So we've seen productivity continue to go up, but wages to remain rel have remained relatively stagnant and working time has not decreased. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's just sort of solidified into this concept of like, well, we work five days a week. Um, the movement for a five day week, a four day work week, uh, it's like that has picked up a lot in recent years and, and particularly this year, 
coming out of the pandemic uh, because I think clearly coming through the pandemic, it, it laid bare how uh, artificial the ways that the rules that we work by are and that productivity isn't time spent. It's what you're able to produce. And that's a more of a function of how well rested you are, how much focus you're able to, to bring to the table, how well organized your workplace is, what, you, what the retention, employee retention and ability to hire is in a workplace. That's our biggest probably drag on productivity at Kickstarter is just, can we keep the great people that we have? Can we hire for new positions quickly enough? Um, and when you look at it through that lens, a four day work week is able to generally speaking, either maintain or increase productivity for a lot of businesses. Um, there's been a number of studies in the UK, the Iceland, Iceland just, uh, announced the results of a four year study with 1% of their population. They moved to a four day work week, 32 hours and um, across all sectors and they saw productivity stayed the same, but everyone was just healthier and happier. They got to spend more time with families. They got to rest more people cook, uh, help, or like eat healthier because they're cooking more for themselves. Mm -hmm. They exercise more. And so there's really no good reason for us not to at least try moving in this direction. And with workplaces sort of figuring out how they want to organize themselves as, as we come out of this pandemic, hopefully for good, um, there's an opportunity to, to rethink the five day work week. Amazing. It almost seems too good to be true. <laughs> so let's dive in a little bit deeper on all the different stakeholders that this affects. And I think it's probably best to start with people, you know, employees, and you already mentioned some of, some of the great benefits that they get from this major change. How do you see the kind of holistic view of the changes from the employee's perspective? And I know you've experimented with this yourself. So if you want to draw on that as well, I'm sure that'd be helpful, helpful for, for folks to hear. Yeah. So from sort of the people perspective, there are, I think people probably intuitively understand the benefits of, of this. It's more time with family. It's more time for rest. There's a lot of burnout concern right now, but that's mm -hmm. been a problem particularly in the United States for a long time. It is just the ability to have more balance in our lives with how we spend our time. And honestly, also how we seek meaning in our lives. This was actually something that we had a, a call yeah. with the U S surgeon general's office this week about this issue. And it's something that they're looking at. A lot of it's about purpose and, and the giving us space to uh, have a more like, kind of healthy identity. Um, one of the things they brought up was just like how many men actually um, go into really severe depression and, and even suicide when they retire just because they've lost their sense of self just by losing work. And that's not really, well, that's not a healthy society. And so... No. I think the way that we look at it is it's an opportunity for us to recenter our lives around what, what really matters and mm -hmm. to lead healthier lives. Makes sense to me. Uh, so what are folks doing with their free time, newfound time? There's a bunch of, I mean, I know that there have been some pilots of mm -hmm. this. I'm guessing there's research as well. What do you know about what people actually do? Yeah, so time with family and rest are the two big things. But about a quarter of people wind up volunteering more, which is actually a, a another wow is one of the reasons why this is something to support from a climate perspective. Um, I know a lot of people in the climate movement are interested in this in large part because of the just that fact that people will spend more time in nature, and about a quarter of people will volunteer more, and that gives us a lot more firepower to engage in the climate fight and a lot more people to engage because not everyone's going to be working full time on a climate tech startup or a nonprofit that is a climate change, but we need to pull everyone into this fight. And I think people want to be pulled into the fight. So that creates a lot more space for that. Yeah. Yeah. It also makes me think of how there are just so many people who 
you know, that you got to put food on the table. People are working multiple jobs. There's no time to even think about anything other than, you know, that day and what you need to get done. And I feel like if you get the same pay and you open up this extra day for yourself, um, then you actually can start to hopefully, uh, you know, start thinking about what's going on in the community or, you know, start looking at uh, a circle that's a bit bigger than your immediate needs, which a lot of people have to do right now. Absolutely. I actually like the idea that this is, you know, there's a lot to be figured out about how this would be implemented across society. But I like the idea of, of keeping school at five days a week, honestly, because teachers, <laughs> teachers do get the summers off and, and kids get the summers off. So it sort of balances out and giving parents just one day a week to not have, not have their kids and be human beings with themselves away from their kids, I think would also be transformative for just a lot of people. I hadn't heard that part of this yet. You should definitely make that <laughs> like central because I think a lot more people would be intrigued. <laughs> That's awesome. So let's, let's look at this from the Employer. employer's perspective now. Is it really making companies more productive? Are they say, staying the same amount of productive? How many are saying, no, this isn't working at all? Like what's the spectrum of what we're looking with, working with here and what's the research saying? We haven't heard about too many failures or, or companies moving to a 40 week and then moving back, back. I know of one case where that happened, but the company had to totally shift their organization, what they were doing. And that required a, a lot. They didn't know how to efficiently cut down their working hours. For most mm -hmm. companies that do this, they maintain or increase productivity. Uh, in a study in uh, the UK, looking at about 290 companies that had moved to a four-day work week, 73% saw increased uh, output as a result of the transition. Wow. And again, it's, it's, it's not, part of it just comes from people being better rested better rested employees are more focused, they're more engaged, they have more creative ideas. I know that when I actually am well rested, I can get a week's worth of work done in a day sometimes when I'm like really on and firing all cylinders. Um, and I've experienced it when I've when I've worked reduced working hours, I got just as much or more done than I do now. <laughs> um, and it felt great. Um, but the, the other benefits that are less obvious there are, are really important, you know, particularly around employee, um, retention and hiring. It's really hard to hire right now. Um, it's been hard for a while and it's so damaging to lose employees. Turnover is a massive problem. And so you see far fewer sick days with a four day work week, um, and employee retention and acquisition is just so much better. And that is resolving one of the, just the biggest drags on any organization. People get very engaged and very loyal uh, for employers that adopt this. That's cool. That's really cool. I'm playing devil's advocate in my head here. If everyone switches though, does that benefit go away? Um, parts of it probably. Um, though certainly the issues of burnout do not. So a big yeah. part of the reason that people leave jobs is not because they necessarily know where they want to go next, but just they need a break. They need a, um, and so if you're able to, if we're able to adopt this across the economy, then that would go down as well. But it also is a benefit that will accrue to the earliest adopters on this. So I think there's a lot to be, uh, there's more to be gained by being early on this. That's a really good point on, on both of those. I was also thinking I'll probably mess this up, but there's some quote out there that says something along the lines of people are going to do, uh, they're going to work for as long as there is time. I'm completely butchering mm -hmm. this, but you know what I'm talking about? Yeah, work, Maybe you can save me here. the time that you give it. So... That's what um, it is. If you have eight hours to do a project, it'll it'll take eight hours. If you only have an hour to do it, you'll it'll take an hour. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Because there is just like there's so much not downtime, but you know, people go out for 
for coffee mm -hmm. or you're surfing the web or whatever it may be if you're stuck in an office. Um, and just, I personally, I know that uh, when I left my job, I got convinced to come back. But when I came back, I was only working part time. Mm -hmm. And I, you know, work that into my contract because I wanted to launch what I'm doing now. And in that part time work, I also was like, okay, I'm also going to work from home half the time. And this is back in, you know, 2016. Um, and or 2017. And I noticed that I could get pretty much everything done that I needed to in like, two thirds of the time uh, as as I would if I were in the office. And so for me, this has been something that's kind of been percolating in my head for a while, even if I had never been labeling it the four day work week, it was just like, I can get the same amount of work done if I have less distractions. And you know, part of it's working from home. But it's just the amount of time that people are working, we can do the same amount, get the same amount of output with less time if we were a bit smarter about Absolutely. it. Absolutely, yes. Uh, so let's get into the climate aspect of this. Um, I'm just gonna hand this over to you. How would this impact emissions and the our, our trajectory for decarbonization overall? Sure, um, so there are different ways of looking at this from a climate perspective. At the low end of the spectrum in the United States, you can just take a look at the difference in carbon emissions on weekdays versus weekend days. So on weekdays, we uh, emit 10% more carbon for electricity generation than we do on mm -hmm. weekend days. So that's our biggest contributor to our national footprint is, is generating electricity for the grid. And we actually, uh, yeah, we emit 10% more carbon for that on weekdays than we do on weekend days. So if we can transition, say Friday from a weekday to a weekend day, that takes actually a big chunk of carbon emissions out. Um, we also drive 17% fewer mile, miles in total on weekend days than we do on weekdays. So just looking at those two things combined, which isn't the whole picture here, but yeah. just looking at those two things combined, a four day work week would reduce our national carbon footprint by about 150 million tons per year. That's like taking Oregon mm -hmm. and Vermont combined and just taking them out of our, uh, our total carbon wow. footprint. Knocks off a couple of states and that's the low end. So there was a study done a few weeks ago that came, that came out a few weeks ago in the United Kingdom looking at a four-day work week and how it reduced carbon emissions. And they predicted a 20% drop in carbon emissions for a four-day work week on a national level, wow. which is very aggressive. So in the United States, that would be the equivalent of about 1.5 billion, 1.5 billion tons of CO2. That would yeah. be an astonishing, astonishing drop in, in carbon emissions. Um, the additional benefits that you get from a four day work week have to do with the ways that people use their time. In this, uh, people tend to do low carbon intensity, uh, use their time in far less carbon intensive uh, ways in a four day work week. So people are mm -hmm. yeah, spending time with family, resting, spending time in nature. All of those things are very low carbon intensive. <laughs> and people cook more, which is less carbon intensive than eating out or getting delivery. Um, people, it's also healthier, the reduced stress and you know, activity, healthier eating habits that have come along with this improves health outcomes. And the health industry itself is a, has a very high carbon footprint. So if you can actually, a healthier population is a less carbon intensive population. And so there's all these things that kind of pile on top of each other not, that are non-intuitive that can add up to much greater yeah. um, benefits. There's so just I don't know where the where it actually lands, but in the United States, being somewhere between 150 million and 1.5 billion tons of CO2 a year, uh, regardless, it is a huge chunk and. 
I, you know, having been in this space for a while and I look at this issue, I'm like, holy cow, we can, I have, I don't know anything in climate where we can take a meaningful chunk out of the problem by doing something that we all want to do. Because <laughs> everything else is like, you know, these, these, you know, take the train instead of flying or, you know, uh, mm -hmm. don't have kids. Uh, what is it like change your light bulbs, put you know, solar panels. It's, it's all like kind of swapping out stuff and trying to make it just as good as it was before. And here we have an opportunity to like do something that everyone wants. <laughs> everyone wants a four day work week. Um, there's like 5% of the population that's anti four day work week. And those wow. people, no one, no one's friends with those people who wants to be friends with someone that is advocating for a five day work week. Um, that's pretty crazy yeah. numbers. So it, it's just, it's like, it, it, to me, it raises this opportunity to, to sh shift our society, to be more balanced, to be healthier, get, create more space for people to be connected to nature, connected to their communities and engaged in the climate fight while mm -hmm. reducing our carbon footprint significantly. And it's a huge, huge lever actually. Um, yeah. And so the question I think is then, well, what's work? What, how do we make this happen? Cause it can also seem very unrealistic, um, as something to achieve. And so what we, so I'm working with four day week global foundation, which was a, which is a foundation advocacy group started by two executives in New Zealand who transitioned their companies over to a four day work week a couple of years ago. Um, and worked with them to create a structure in the United States where we are just trying to collect as many signatures as possible, particularly within a single employer, and use that support to recruit companies to pilot a four-day work week in 2022. So we want to create this sort mm -hmm. of class of companies that are all piloting a four-day week at the same time. Kickstarter has committed to doing this next year, which is great. So as, as it will be in the inaugural class of four-day week companies. Um, and so all we really, who else yeah. is in it so far? I'm sorry. Who else is in the inaugural class so far? I know you're just starting just out, but so is there any, you having conversations? Yeah. Kickstarter joined before we even announced <laughs> a couple <laughs> weeks ago. So we've started conversations with other employers and for the, for the employers where there's a lot of employee support already on the petition, which people can sign at action.4dayweek.com. Uh, for the number mm -hmm. four, um, not written out, but uh, so we, we can, you can see which employers have a lot of employee support or interest in a four day week. And we're reaching out to those employers to say, look, you've got 50 employees already that are interested in this. We are hosting this pilot next year for companies. We're providing those companies with a ton of free support and connecting them with each other and working with academics at Harvard, Oxford, UPenn to uh, look at the study, the outcomes of this, these pilots want to join us yeah. next year in doing this. So those conversations are happening now. That's awesome. How are they going so far? It does seem like a pretty sweet support system. Yeah, no, they're, uh, they're going great, actually, better than I anticipated because companies are really open right now and really interested in this and being able to talk to them uh, about the benefits, particularly around employee retention and, and hiring and what we've seen at Kickstarter. It helps that I, I'm an executive at Kickstarter. I also uh, um, sit at the bargaining table for our union negotiations. And so I come mm -hmm. from a perspective that's uh, very familiar with sort of the concerns of being an executive at a, at a company and having to make decisions about the future of the business and how to manage employees and their, what they might be advocating for. So. Um, I think that's helpful, at least in, in terms of holding these conversations with employers, but they're, they're universally very interested in it. That's good to hear. Um, what, I guess I'm curious how many companies, if you know, I don't know if, if you know, or if this information is out there, but how many have already tried this before? Do you have any idea? Um, there's, there's no central like firm number on this. No one knows. Yeah. Uh, we have cataloged about 200 to 300 businesses 
that are currently operating on a four-day work week or some kind of, of reduced hour schedule. Um, obviously, the four-day work week mm -hmm. is sort of shorthand, uh, and not every business is working. You know, nursing shifts work differently than uh, the standard office job. But there's examples of nursing com companies that are dealing with nursing that have found a way to reduce working hours for their staff, which have improved health outcomes and made the, the people happier and, and reduced their turnover, which actually reduces their overall costs, even though they have to mm -hmm. they hire more employees. Um, it actually works out in the long run. So there's, it's taking those examples and working with those companies to find the right fit uh, for what they're doing. Yeah. So this is also making me think this is almost another way of raising the minimum wage in a way, correct? It's like kind of a roundabout way. People are going to get paid the same, but they're going to work less hours. Um, and then it, it also seems like a way to employ more people. That's correct. Uh, Both of those statements are correct. Okay. I'm just wrapping my head around here. And another question I have for you is, will this work across industries? Like, are, are there certain, is there going to be any inequality here in terms of like, oh, this industry would never be able to do this. If you work in this space, mm -hmm. you're going to have to work uh, more than everyone else hours wise. Yeah. How does, how does that play out? Yeah, that's, that's been one of our biggest concerns since the beginning of this is what, that sort of equity, labor equity piece of it. Um, fortunately, we, there are success stories from virtually every type of business uh, that have found ways to make this work for their, for their workers. It does, it's easier in some contexts than others. So a company like Kickstarter that is computer-based, can be remote, um, is probably the easiest type of company to transition and is more representative of an early adopter company uh, in this movement. Mm -hmm. But the elsewhere, it takes a little bit more um, intention, a little bit, a little bit more risk, I'd say, uh, to adopt a forty work week. But there are successful restaurant chains that have done this for their staff and their service staff. There are construction companies, uh, manufacturing companies, where we often hear you can't do this in manufacturing. Five day work week came from manufacturing. Um, you absolutely can. It just requires a, a business to take a look at their staff, to prioritize the well being of that staff, and to understand that where they're seeing turnover and can't hire or can't retain employees in the long term, how much that costs a business. And that even if you have to hire a few more people to make up those hours on something that, you know, on an assembly line, for instance, that needs to be operating 24 seven, that the benefits outweigh the costs in the long term, um, both from a human perspective, but also from a business perspective. 100%. Uh, so you might repeat yourself here because I know you covered a bit of it early on, but I'd love to hear what the short and long-term goals are of this campaign. So short-term goal is to just get as many people to sign on and raise their hands and say, yes, I want to see employers move towards a four-day work week. So it's a low to ask mm -hmm. thing <laughs> I can imagine. So if people want to do that, again, go to action Um And I'll link to that in the show notes for folks. Wonderful. Um, and for us, it's building a kind of a collection group of employers in next year that are trialing this together. So we want to see at least probably 15 employers in that group. Um, we want those employers to be representing different types of industries. So we're working hard to recruit, you know, businesses in the restaurant industry and nursing and uh, manufacturing alongside sort of traditional white collar businesses. Um, and then following that pilot, it will be just recruiting additional employers to this and, and really building kind of establishing enough momentum on this within the employer space that everyone starts sort of moving along. It doesn't take probably that much. It takes a decent amount of, of movement on this to get employers started on this. Once you get a, a, mm -hmm. a critical mass going, 
the whole thing is is sort of a, a snowball rolling downhill and, and picks up its own steam because other employees other employers have to follow suit because they're not going to be able to hire or retain employees if their competitor is offering this. There's no way. Yeah, <laughs> seriously. <laughs> kind of a no-brainer yeah. so that's what we want to get to and, there, and there's policy shifts that that would be helpful from a government perspective as well that to help facilitate that transition so that's that's things we'll be looking at in 2022 and beyond on this issue gotcha that is awesome uh i've signed it i'll definitely be encouraging other other people to sign it so best of luck on that um I, I think it would be so good in so many ways if we had that four day work week and it also kind of help change our mindset and culture a little bit towards prioritizing people instead of this, whatever we got going on <laughs> yes. right now. And, we, kind of and that mindset shift is, is critical to the climate fight, right? I mean, it's, it's our skewed system of values of what of yeah. what we value in our society is what got us into this mess in the fir- in the first place. So we're going to have yeah. to go through this shift in order to get ourselves out of it. Love it. Uh, okay, great. I don't want to keep you for too much longer. I know we've been chatting for like an hour or so already. Uh, so I've got just a couple wrap up questions for you. What book or books do you recommend or gift to people the most? Uh, the book I would recommend right now that, that your audience probably hasn't heard as a recommendation on this in the past um, is The Sea Around Us, which is a gift to me and I've, mm-hmm. I've gifted to someone else um, and still in the midst of reading. It's a book by uh, Rachel Carson who wrote Silent Spring. So I, I believe it was written in the 1960s, maybe 1970s. It's a, it's a book about the oceans, but it's written in this way that is speaks to kind of like the mystery and like poetic nature, you know, aspects of nature and the ocean. And some of the science is like yeah. way outdated, but I kind of find that fun. Uh, and it's just a delightful book. I, <laughs> I spend a lot of time at the beach in New York city and go surfing a lot. And so it's a nice companion to spending time out there. Awesome. Sounds like a good one. Uh, my other question or just kind of a, final thing do you have any key takeaways or final messages or any other call to action for folks i know we're gonna be sharing this link for people to sign the petition um anything else you want to share as parting thoughts uh i mean the main thing is just reiterating really what you said earlier which is about just starting to get involved in this and finding the path that makes the most sense for you and not being so overwhelmed by the issue itself to um, not take any action. So find ways to participate at work, in your community, on climate. If people do want to participate in Four Day Week, they should know where to find that campaign at fourdayweek.com. They can also participate in the This Place Will Be Water or This Place Will Burn. Those websites are thisplacewillbewater.org, thisplacewillburn.org. So pretty easy to find. Um, but it's really about finding, I don't think you have to find the thing in climate for you. There's not a capital T thing for you to be doing typically, but start finding some things to do. Um, and uh, I think the rest will figure it out from there. Very well said. John, thank you again for coming on the show and all the important work that you're doing and uh, just for taking the time and sharing this message and best of luck to the the campaign. I'll be rooting for you. Thanks so much, Ryan. Awesome. That was good. I think we got some good stuff in there. (laughs) I hope so. It was fun. (laughs) Uh, Yeah. I I mean, I always enjoy conversations with climate people. (laughs) nerding out on this stuff. Yeah. Um, I do have two more questions for you. I don't know if we'll work them mm-hmm. in, but this is more of my curiosity. Um, do you know if bottom lines were effective, affected uh, 
you know, the profitability of companies when the move went from the six day work week to the five day work week? Overall, it grew the economy. Really? Yeah. This, I mean, because it created, if you, if you reduce working hours and keep salaries the same, you're basically just opening up more space and time for economic activity. So the original Mm -hmm. transition from six day work week to a five day work week created really the weekend economy. And so a three day weekend transforms that weekend economy into something even greater. Um, So it would be an economic, a driver of economic growth, most likely. I think that point should be hammered as much as possible. (laughs) uh, The existing mindset. We have the support of, um, the former chief economist for the Department of Labor, uh, Dean Baker, who is a very prominent economist, um, also supports this. There's a number of economists that are highly supportive of a four-day work week as a economic uh, driver. Very cool. Uh, the very last thing that I thought of um, while we were talking is if you are an employee listening to this Mm -hmm. and you want to start moving your company towards this or get the conversation going or, you know, what should someone listening do uh, if they want their company to make this transition? So I encourage people to read about it and, and the benefits for people and businesses that have made this transition. They can learn about that on our website, action.4dayweek.com. Uh, and from there, I think one, just generating interest amongst employees is really helpful and approaching the company about this, the opportunity or the, the idea of piloting it or testing it. Um, you can, there's a lot of great companies that have done a lot of documentation about their tests of a four day work week and, and what they went through to adopt it, uncharted. Uh, a uh, business out of Colorado did a great job documenting their process on Medium through a series of Medium posts. It's really about approaching your employer and saying, like, look, this is, there's a lot of reasons for us to try this, both for the people that work here and for the business itself. There's enough evidence that, that suggests that this should be possible. I'd love to talk about how to make uh, a just a test of this work for the business and, you know, for all of us and and starting the conversation in a sort of constructive way um, is I think the best path for most employees. If they are a little nervous about starting that conversation internally, they are free to reach out to our campaign through our website um, and we can help them start that conversation. If they get a lot of it, if they have a lot of employees at their company that are interested, we are, we're very happy to start that conversation for them. That's awesome. And uh, I'm guessing you haven't really done that yet, but is that kind of the strategy you you gain a lot of signatures or you know how many employees are interested at a specific company and then what what do you do from there? Yeah, so when anyone can see how many signatures are at, uh, are within every employer that's, you know, signed on to, um, had had an employee signed on to the campaign. So you can go to the campaign website and see like, oh, there's, I think 45 employees at Airbnb that want this. Um, Mm -hmm. And so when we see numbers climb up like that, we reach out to their executive team, to their head of HR and say, Hey, look, you've got 45 people already at your company that are interested in this. We're hosting this pilot program next year. We really want to support employers to, to experiment with this and see if they can make it work and think it's worthwhile for you, particularly given that your employee, employees are interested in this. Let's talk about yeah. how to get you comfortable with making um, that decision. It's awesome. It reminds me of, uh, do you know Climate Voice with Bill yeah. Weil? Seems like a very similar strategy in both, both amazing initiatives that I hope are wildly successful. Yeah. <laughs> me too. <laughs> good stuff all right well i will let you run for real now and we'll take it from Great. here